when looking at the intensity or the magnitude of a cyber attack, the chosen target is often a better indicator of magnitude than the, uh, the nature of the attack itself. We want to make sure that all our staff are trained well to identify the threat that could be around the system. The cyber criminal ecosystem, the, uh, uh, the synergy between different players, uh, including outsourcing, specialized subcontracting, customer service, there is uh, an economic system that would be the envy of the legitimate world. Hello and welcome to Connected. I'm Divi Gopalan. Are your systems secure? That's a question many businesses are asking themselves as digital transformation forges ahead. Yet usually you only get the answer when security has been breached. Well, the global security market is set to grow by 56% to nearly 300 billion US dollars in 2028. But that growth is also a reflection of the rapid rise in cybersecurity threats around the world. In fact, the global annual cost of cybercrime is forecast to jump to nearly 14.6 trillion US dollars by the end of this year. And to help us understand how cybersecurity risks impact digital innovation, we're joined by Thomas Parenti in Taipei. Now, he's a former NSA cybersecurity expert, co-founder of Artifact Group, and author of the books Digital Defense and A Leader's Guide to Cybersecurity. That's published by the Harvard Business Review Press. And also joining us from Singapore is Patrick Ko. He's the director of CWG Markets, a UK-licensed online trading platform which enables users in some 130 countries, including Taiwan, to trade stocks and foreign exchange futures and other financial instruments. Thank you both so much for joining us. It's great to have you on the program. I want to start with this. Now, several cybercrime cases have grabbed headlines. Just last year, ransomware gang known as Lockbit, I believe, claimed responsibility for cyber attacks on London's financial district. Las Vegas casinos run by MGM and Caesars were also hit by a series of heists that some called the Ocean's Eleven of the Cyber Age. Now, this is for you, Thomas. What is the most audacious cyber attack you've seen in your professional in your profession? Uh, I was going to say the most audacious cyber attack I've seen in my profession is one that I can't talk about. Um, <laughs> however, um, I can. Um, uh, uh, following on the, the observations and the, the cases that you had mentioned, um, highlight a ransomware attack from February 21st, uh, just, uh, just over a month ago, on a company in the United States called Change Healthcare. It is the largest clearinghouse for health insurance claims in the United States. They uh, have around 130 million customers and process around uh, 15 uh, billion transactions a year. And... Uh, the same group that hit the Colonial Pipeline a few years ago uh, mounted an attack against them. And what makes this attack remarkable is not so much the sophistication of the ransomware attack, because those are um, sort of very common. It's rather the impact of the attack. Uh, and uh, the uh, healthcare in the United States is paid for very, very differently from uh, Taiwan. Uh, there are hundreds of insurance companies with many different policies. It's more complex than a mobile phone plan. And because of this hack, those insurance claims couldn't be processed. So the first wave of impact was on patients who were no longer able to get prescriptions filled or go to the doctor. The second wave was on hospitals, pharmacies, uh, and small clinics that operate with very low cash on hand and have very high operating costs. And because of not being able to get reliable insurance, uh, insurance reimbursement, many of them had to take out loans, lay off uh, employees, and some are going out of business. And so the overall impact of this attack, even after all of the systems are restored, will be very long term. It also points out that when looking at the intensity or the magnitude of a cyber attack, um, the target, chosen target, is often a better indicator of magnitude than the, uh, the nature of the attack itself. Now, speaking of targets, we talked about the attack on London's financial district, Patrick, and trading and investing are often very vulnerable sectors. So for um, CWG markets, which one is more important? Is it the monetary security or platform and data security? Or can you not separate them? 
I think in terms of um, CWG standpoints, um, we need both data securities and as well as monetary securities because on the fact that in terms of monetary securities, the FCAs are regulating CWG. So what they need is to make sure that we are here to prevent any fraudulent trades. We're here to make sure the transactions are good and then we comply with what's required for FCAs under the regulatory framework. So, but again, the data securities would then give confidentiality to our customers. You know, we would then, you know, allow um, the correct users to come on board to make sure that the, the authorized users are able to come at the right time to make sure that tradings are all in line with what is what they want. So, um, Thomas, I want to bring your attention to another alarming statistic. Some 90% of chief information security officers, or CISO, reported suffering major cybersecurity attacks over the past two years. What's behind that rise? Well, I think there are a couple of factors at play, um, one of which is that uh, you can make money. Uh, and so the, the fact that mounting a cyber attack uh, uh, there is both money and a safer working environment than many other crimes attracts both individuals and, and organizations. Um, it is also the case that the, uh, the techniques and uh, tactics that criminals uh, are using are evolving over time. Though I think actually a much bigger factor is, if you will, the cyber criminal uh, e ecosystem. Um, the uh, uh, the synergy between different players, uh, including outsourcing, specialized subcontracting, customer service, there is a, an economic system that would be the envy of the legitimate world. And that makes uh, the mounting of attacks much easier. Uh, the final uh, factor I would say is that there are just many more targets because of uh, digitalization of almost all aspects of our life. There are many more um, uh, areas uh, in which criminals can then exploit weakness. Right, and you know, and that goes down to the whole idea of being fast and innovative, and you know, g keeping up with digital transformation. But at the same time, there is that risk, as you said. So, Patrick, then. Of course, your online traders want that kind of service, the, the fast service and secure service, but how much do they really look into the security side of things when they come to you? Um, I think when they come to me, they're, they're really looking for whether are we a, a company that has our network secure, because at the end of the day, they want to make sure there's no intrusion. Um, just give you a very simple example. When you're trading online, you do not want your servers to be down especially when there's a DOS attack. It's going to cause them a lot of money. And at the end of the day, they'll come back to us, hey, your trading environment is never secure. Why are you giving us that platform? We want something better. And obviously, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that all our staff are trained well to identify the threat that could be around the system. First of all, we have our CRM system to take care of to make sure that the private data of all individual customers are not linked to anyone because under the FCA regulatory framework, all the data are private. So in a sense that if that data was to be leaked out and that is a breach of the FCA requirement. Now, practically all businesses, whether in tech or not, will see their digital exposure growing. As customers and partners become even more digitally engaged, their cybersecurity exposure is also bound to grow. So we ask who is responsible for maintaining cybersecurity? We spoke with Lennon Chang. He's a professor of cyber risk and policy at Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia. He is also the executive committee member of the University Center for Cyber Resilience and Trust. Take a listen. When we say cybercrime is without borders, it also indicates a, 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 a Formula, f phenomena like uh, the transnational organized crime. You need international collaborations in fighting against this type of crime. So the first issue here would be, yes, it would be individual government's responsibility to set up their own rules, but what happened if um, there's a dual criminality issues? The idea is that it's everyone's responsibility. Not only, it's not the things that government will be able to deal uh, with it themselves, nor the private sectors, the startup companies will be able to deal with themselves. And uh, we know m most of the time we're talking about uh, regulations, um, we're talking about norms. Um, 
Sometimes it would come down to uh, the issue we just discussed, um, the cyber hygiene and uh, cyber resilience, whether we provide enough uh, information to the users to let them know there's a risk of using this technology and to let them know when uh, when a cyber, uh, when, when attack happens or when your money has been uh, wired out, how can you do and what can you do? I guess in, um, with all these transformations, there are all these new terms coming out like cyber hygiene to uh, a whole new language, isn't there? Um, now, I want to take it back to your career, uh, Thomas. Early in your career, you worked at the U.S. National Security Agency, better known as the NSA. You also testified in front of the U.S. Congress five times on national security and global competitiveness issues. Now. Do our governments and corporations aligned in their approach to security? I would say that's wishful thinking. Um, uh, not, not because of any malintention on uh, anyone's part, but the interests of government and the interests of private companies are actually quite different. Um, also, the perspectives they have with respect to the security of their systems is likewise very different. Um, and that is a company has a primary responsibility for uh, making money as a company and uh, a, uh, an obligation to protect uh, various stakeholders. They also have insights into all of their internal uh, computer operations and the risks associated with them. Governments, however well-intentioned, are always on the outside. And um, their interests, either national security and law enforcement, are very different from the commercial interests of individual companies. So, Patrick, um, for trading platforms, there are a number of priorities, uh, from financial stability to reputation uh, to customer trust, which can be affected by hacks and cyber crimes. Um, so how do you assess the cost of cybersecurity and weigh it against the cost of preventing future risk? I think to start with, we need to access the risk that is being involved. I think in, in terms of my business, um, at the end of the day, the trading servers is the most important um, machine that we are, we are taking care of. So um, from my experience, we have various US attacks on our servers and every attack can cost us you know, at least five minutes to an hour of downtime. And we can we can cause that under the direct monetary cost. We also have the other part of it, which is indirect. So what is direct uh, cost? Direct cost will be how much are we going to spend on preventing this from happening? And also, second is how are we going to make that cost to detect and monitor the attack and when it's going to come again? So, and obviously we need to choose someone that holds our servers with a great um, um, job, rather than someone who doesn't know his job and then we get someone at a cheaper cost to run our servers. And the third one will be, how do we respond to it? So if we respond it at a very quick time, we bring down the minimum cost, that would then be a very cost, cost I mean, less, I mean, smaller cost to us when it comes to whether we balance it with the cost and benefits. And obviously, at the end of the day, we must make sure that we implement the correct cybersecurity at the correct price, because if you're spending too much and it, you know, it's going to run into your fixed cost, it's going to be very costly for us to run at the end of the day. Right. So, so given that it seems like a substantial cost will go or a part of your budget will go towards um, cybersecurity, when, when you're thinking of launching a new product or launching kind of some other, uh, some other customer service, how much of a thought or how much of that plan goes into cybersecurity? How much of that is part of the discussion? I think at the end of the day, I think the team, inter, um, the inter-departments, the, the, the market department and as well as the security teams has to come hand in hand. We need to find a balance. I always like to use the term middle ground because um, we do not want to come up with a product that would then create a lot of insecure functions which allowed the hackers or intruders to come into our system and create an havoc at the end of the day. So um, the priorities for traders, for our customers, is to make sure that when they lock into our system, they are being authenticated. And at the end of the day, they want to make sure the price they're getting are not being distorted by any hackers. So 
what we need from our companies to make sure that we always come hand to hand, balance out to make sure that the person that's going to come up with the, the new product, the new innovations, will then interact with the team in the cybersecurity to make sure that we find a balance. Thomas, as we talk about development, one of one. One new development, I guess, or the part of this changing world is AI that's definitely going to affect or be part of almost everything we do now. <laughs> how, how, Thomas, how, how much is that impacting the risks of cybersecurity? Uh, and what are our startups and companies uh, equipped to deal with that? Is, is that? Are they thinking about that right now? Um, the, the general... Uh sort of perception around artificial intelligence right now, I think relates to um, the topics of uh, disinformation, fakes, um, uh, and the, the danger to public discourse that it provides, uh, as well as uh, dislocating various jobs in the, creative, in, in the creative arts. Specifically within the cybersecurity domain, AI has been touted as something that could either enhance an attacker's ability to figure out how to get into your systems or help a defender be better able to detect an attacker. Now, what I would say uh, is one of the optimal uh, uses of AI to protect against attacks is to uh, help with software development. A vast majority of the cyber attacks exploit software vulnerabilities uh, in commercial software. And there are AI-based products now that e can either evaluate somebody else's program for security vulnerabilities or write code themselves that doesn't do not have those vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities, by the way, that have been known about for decades. But to write good software is a really difficult task. And so in this particular case, I think if one looked at applying AI for the development of more robust software products, you then eliminate so many cyber attacks that, uh, that we suffer from regularly. Okay, let's take a look at the costs of managing cybersecurity. The bar on the left shows that just over one third of companies are likely to spend significantly more on cybersecurity this year. A resounding 93% intend to increase their spending to some extent. Meanwhile, on the right, we see how much cyber attackers are getting paid for their efforts. Just over half of the payouts for ransomware attacks are worth at least 100,000 US dollars. One in 10 payouts are worth $1 million or more. Now, Patrick, fast growth for tech companies often seems like a double-edged sword. Cyber risks grow while just as much as the business exposure. So how can companies address cybersecurity alongside with the need for speed and innovation, which is often what your customers will be looking for? Um, I think I think it's definitely a double-edged sword. So at the end of the day, I think we, we need to develop a system uh, by design, which means that security by design. Um, we need to make sure that um, when we have that system in place, we also need to have the security at the same time to make sure that all both and in hand. Understand from the chart that you provided, um, a lot of people are going to spend a lot of money on security. So I think, and the second thing that I'm looking at is um, cyber security is something that not for everyone, not everyone will know it, but in, in a company. So employing training, it's the second most important thing. So to make our, our staff be aware what is causing us a havoc right now in this cyber world. So I think the two things that we're looking at is to make sure that we the team itself need to talk to each other. The team itself need to know what is happening. The team itself need to know what cybersecurity threat is. So employee training is very important to prevent the next big cyber attack on CWG, if you were to say that, per se. Now, Thomas, as we heard there, managing cybersecurity and innovation is, is, is a balance, balancing act. Do you have any examples of what, what works? Or what kind of a model would work well when it comes to trying to manage kind of change or transformation and then bring in the whole cybersecurity conversation within that? Um, certainly. What I'd like to do is actually start with what the standard model is for large established organizations. And that is that you would have one group involved in innovation or product development. You would ha then have a separate cybersecurity group that would perform uh, a review or audit or a compliance check on that work to see whether or not 
uh, the, the product or project should go forward. Now, what Patrick was talking about is a much better but not widely enough adopted model, which is at the very front end, you have those involved in innovation and those involved in protection um, or establishing trust in the in the uh, the operation of the the product working closely together. It is much much better um, when the innovators are first encounter a potential problem to find a solution as opposed to continue with the development only at a later point to realize that there was some fundamental uh, flaw. So in that sense, how would you say that um, startups can mitigate cybersecurity risks without that um, casting a shadow on innovation or making people take, take the other risks they need to create a business? Uh, unfortunately, the answer to that uh, rests in external forces beyond an individual company's control. Uh, and uh, especially within the, uh, the uh, software digital uh, uh, product uh, environment, um, there is an imperative to get the product out as fast as possible. It doesn't need to be perfect. We can fix it in another release. And so the, um, the, the pressure to uh, get out new features, new releases, um, regardless of uh, the, uh, the risks, is a very, very strong uh, motivator or force upon uh, many, many startups. And if you were to tell your investors that ah, we're letting our competitor get to market first, because we are spending time to make sure that a vulnerability that may or may not be attacked in the future isn't there, that's not a winning argument. Now, given that we're um, in Taiwan, it's important to point out that that market force is not true uh, in all areas of innovation. And specifically uh, looking at um, uh, uh, chips and computers and uh, the semiconductor industry is that those companies that produce hardware spend a great deal of time and effort to make sure that the design and fabrication is done correctly because the cost of redesign, recall, redeploying uh, uh, all of that hardware is incredibly high. Um, so in some sense, with respect to innovation in hardware, market dynamics help protect us from cyber risks. But in the area of software, uh, they actually expose us to more risks. Right, and, and if we go back to the idea of um, risk and AI, and this is for you, Patrick, um, we kind of touched on it, but it's clearly something that all businesses will eventually be engaging in some form or, or the other. Have you considered how it could be part of your business, for example, in cyber or financial risk management? And if that's the case, how are you approaching it? How the AI will then play a part on my business is um, AI could then detect fraud. That is the first thing that we're looking at and prevention. Um, as you know, we, we are in a market making business. Um, detecting fraud and fraud prevention is very almost important because that's going to hit our bottom line. And second is AI model would then um, come up with a risk model that allow us to do a risk management because again, I re-emphasize we're on a market making business. Um, we are putting um, spreads and CFDs in, in FX market for our customers. So uh, at the end of the day, risk management play an important part in our portfolio and AI with the AI tools that could actually mitigate the risk and manage our risk much better. And obviously it could um, enhance the cybersecurity that has been emphasized by Thomas. And the next thing is being regulated by FCA, uh, our regulatory compliance, that's the most important because FCA will be running every day on us. Are we complying with what is required? So that could help in some of AI model. And last but not least is very much um, for our customers. Um, we have heard a lot about AI being able to personalize trading strategy, making monies, but at the end of the day, AI models are still very green. I mean, I believe Thomas would agree with me. Um, we, we probably are 50% there, but there have been a lot of traders who claim that, you know, I have an AI model that works. This is going to work for me, especially for high frequency traders, because at the end, the AI is about digesting data. They are, they are, they are just collecting tons and tons of data to, to prove that their strategy is correct. So um, in our line, we see a lot of high frequency traders relying on data 
pass data to make an informed decision to trade in the market at a very single second. And if we push it even for more further forward, let's uh, talk about quantum computing, Thomas. Um, that could completely change the rules of the game when it comes to cybersecurity. How much are companies preparing for that? Um, actually, more than I would uh, more than I would have imagined. Uh, actually, Apple uh, is actively involved in, in uh, updating the encryption uh, used in its products to be able to address quantum computing. Now, what's important to um, sort of point out is the increased, massively increased processing power that you get with quantum computing can compromise some, but not all, of the encryption algorithms that are currently in use. And so um, what needs to be done is for uh, the producers of software products to then um, look at replacing the uh, encryption that is vulnerable to uh, quantum computing to uh, different encryption algorithms or mo models that are resistant to it. Uh, and so in terms of the average consumer or the average company that buys data processing equipment, uh, digital, uh, digital equipment, um, you have no role in it. Um, uh, all of the work has to be done by the people who are producing the products that include encryption. And what I would say is that it, is a, it will be a concern in the future. It is not a concern for, for quite a while. All right, that's good to know and that's good to hear. Thank you both so much. We've run out of time. Really appreciate both your thoughts and insights. Uh, Patrick, Thomas, thank you so much for being on the show. And to our viewers everywhere, it's been good to have your company. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed today's episode or have anything you'd like to add to the dialogue, do join the conversation on our social media. And remember, stay informed, stay engaged, and stay connected.